Hi, I'm Blythe Stevens, MFA Bliss Catalyst and founder of A Blythe Coach, dance education and coaching to move through life with balance, grace, and power. Today I'm joining you for a non dancey practice. We are sitting down to nerd out, to talk story, to talk about the story, the history, the choreography, the music, and the message of the classic ballet, Cinderella. I especially enjoy teaching and revisiting Cinderella in the fall or in the autumn months, right at the beginning of school before Halloween, what with the theme of harvesting the fruits of one's actions and the supernatural elements, as well as the presence of pumpkins with which to make the magical coat that appears in some versions of the story. And that's what we're exploring today in episode 65 of the Ave Life Coach podcast, providing weekly dance education and coaching to move through life with balance, grace, and power. Now, I use the ballet in so many different ways, depending on what age of group I'm working with and what it is we're learning at that point in the year and in their cycle of learning. But that can include teaching the virtues, teaching the moral, the storytelling and expression, whether it be linguistic or as well as musical and with the movement vocabulary used, the choreography choices, teaching musicality, teaching the, the technique, specific techniques and movement skills required, and as well as the repertory, some of the variations, waltzes, mazurkas, and other elements that appear in Cinderella, as well as teaching the ballet's history and appreciation. Last spring, I did a podcast, blog, and also a video about how I teach the story, the themes, and uh, the history of Sleeping Beauty. So you can also check that content out, and I'll also be creating a playlist on the YouTube channel of uh, how I teach the stories of different ballets. So we've started with Sleeping Beauty, now we'll have Cinderella, and coming in the future, we'll have other classic and modern ballets. Let me know which ones you'd particularly like to see more about, learn more about the music, the choreography, the history, and how I teach that in my ballet technique classes with all ages, again, in the comments below. So I'm trying to experiment today. We are recording live for the podcast, which I will also have video for and can therefore edit and post that both as audio to the podcast and as video to the YouTube channel. Therefore, maybe the lighting is not the best. I hope we can still get the message and the information across and know that this content will also be presented in blog form on my blog and that will link up to the podcast, any other videos that I have that are relevant to this theme as well. So let's give it a shot. If you have seen any of my other more theoretical and dance appreciation videos, you will have seen me get out some of my favorite books and resources, and today is no different. I'm gonna be sharing with you some of my very favorite resources when it comes to teaching and learning about Cinderella, both as a ballet and also as a classic fairy tale that's been told the world over. I wrote a haiku lately as part of my daily uh, haiku challenge of 2021, and it happens to deal also with Cinderella. It goes, Cinderella B, courageous and kind always, winning the kingdom. And I wanted to share this in connection with Cinderella, which is one of the world's most classic, iconic, and ubiquitous tales. The ballet can provide a nice entree into the universal themes and concepts useful in life and interdisciplinary topics within and beyond dance. Have courage and be kind is one of the best morals I can imagine for a fairy tale. Knowing that life and success are going to require bravery and leaving one's comfort zone and that learning requires courage, I believe it is an important characteristic to develop in young people. As for kindness, the activity of loving one another, I find to be the most important life and world changing quality a person can have. Cinderella is a person of character. She demonstrates forbearance, 
and compassion towards her sisters, even people who are quite unkind or even cruel to her. These virtues are related to the ground rules that I share for dancing with every one of my dance classes starting from when children are three years old. I originally learned these actually from a colleague, Jonathan Seipert, and we were both associated with a studio called The Movement Center in Honolulu, Hawaii. And I know he and I in our teaching as well at the middle school and high school, elementary, middle school and high school level, as well as in higher education, still go back to versions of these basic rules, which are be safe, be respectful, and have fun. Now in the fall, I'm also teaching or reviewing, revisiting as we return to school and return to the studio, what our ground rules, what are, what are the most important shared values that we have that create a safe and effective space for learning. Those are always be safe, be respectful and have fun. And they become more sophisticated, of course, as the students grow older and more experienced. So what does being careful and safe have to do with courage like Cinderella exhibits it, where she dares to go to a ball, where she dares to have kindness towards someone who others might hold in fear. It is being wise and discerning and taking necessary calculated risks. It is being observant and aware, remaining calm and responding appropriately to changing circumstances. It is taking care of ourselves and of others. That's where the number two comes in, the respect, taking care of ourselves and others. And kindness go hand in hand. Grace, friendliness, understanding, acceptance, compassion, honesty, and generosity of spirit all fall under this respect. Open-mindedness does as well to embrace diversity, think creatively, solve problems, connect and build relationships and community. Appreciation for others' contribution to our lives in all of our blessings. Also, this gratitude falls into respect and appreciation. Now, Cinderella remains hopeful and fanciful and has a really wonderful life of the mind, dreaming and dancing, keeping a sense of possibility, even under oppressive, abusive, what appears to be a toxic and cruel situation. She sometimes dances on her own. She keeps a fantasy alive. She hopes that maybe she can also go to the ball, despite it seeming unlikely that this will come to pass. In Cinderella, she gives bread to an elderly lady who comes begging. This is portrayed differently in different versions, but there's a constant theme of others shirking away and avoiding this beggar woman who comes to the door and Cinderella being the one who's willing to engage with her. And although she has almost nothing to give, gives whatever she can in the form of some bread. Cinderella is generous. She's patient. She cultivates those relationships with who she can, whether they're coming to door, the door as a stranger or trying to be connected with her family, such as it is. And even the birds, in many versions, uh, there are birds that come to Cinderella's aid, whether they're sent from God or whether they're sent from the her fairy godmother or whether it also involves fairies of the seasons, there's these supernatural elements or possibly natural elements that are coming to assist her to meet her um, generosity in return. So it's rewarded. Since the old woman turns out to be her fairy godmother in disguise and able to grant her wish to attend the prince's ball, Cinderella ultimately gets a very rich reward for her virtue. So how do I teach this ballet as far as balletic history and appreciation? Well, I use a lot of this classic, Balanchine's Complete Stories of the Great Ballets, which is also authored not only by George Balanchine, by, but by Francis Mason. Now, please keep in mind, this is a very dated book. It is a wonderfully comprehensive book as far as classical ballets of that time a lot of the language and ideas are also quite outdated. I was actually shocked that a couple passages that appear in this section, I will omit them. But if you want to engage with me about what is problematic about uh, either the fairy tale story or the way it's been portrayed in different versions of the ballet or in the way it is also reviewed and documented in dance history by 
Valentine and others, I'm super happy to have that conversation. I think it's important to view this with a critical eye. However, in today's video, we're focusing more at what good can we find in it and how can we share that. And of course, that's always with a critical eye and ear and an interest in making things better as we go forward. However, as far as capturing the history of the ballet and the versions that have appeared on stage, this is a really good resource. So they say, ballet in three acts and seven scenes. Music by Sergei Prokofiev. Choreography by Rotislav Zakharov. Libretto by Nikolai Volkov. This is first presented by the Bolshoi Ballet at the Bolshoi Theater, Moscow, November 15th, 1945. Now that seems really recent, does it not? However, that is the music by Prokofiev, which is a much more recent version of the ballet music than what, uh, what had been performed with before. We can talk about that again in a second. But this version from 1946 of that, Balanchine says, quote, Prokofiev wrote that he conceived of Cinderella, quote, as a classical ballet with variations, adagios, pas de deux, etc. I see Cinderella not only as a fairy tale character, but also as a real person, feeling, experiencing, and moving among us. Pretty much love that, that excerpt. And then he goes on to detail the whole story of the ballet, which, um, you can read the full excerpt in in this book if you want to refer to that. Um, nothing in there was very shocking to me, having seen different versions of the ballet. Some there's some different takes, but especially in the choreography, it comes out. So we won't dive into those nuances right now. However, he does say there's another version, another ballet in three acts version with the. Prokofiev music that then had choreography by Frederick Ashton. Now this one is very frequently cited and used in the other sources that I'll be sharing today. This was first presented by the Sadler's Wells Ballet of the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, London, December 23rd, 1948. It had Moira Shearer as Cinderella, etc., etc. Of particular interest, I found Robert Helpman and Frederick Ashton as Cinderella's stepsisters. So in this case, he will, he will share a little bit more about the travesty later. But he says, quote, Cinderella is a story everybody knows, and in the past it has attracted a great number of choreographers, French, Russian, and English. This particular ballet, or this particular ballet on the story, however, is important for a special reason. It is the first classic English ballet in three acts, the first full-length English work in the style and the manner of the great 19th century classics. But Cinderella is entertaining as well as important. Here, the familiar tale is embellished with dramatic and comic differences with divertissement and with the grace and warmth of the grand academic style. So you got to um, appreciate the structure, Valentina is saying, and how this classical ballet structure takes a particular form and that's being played out here. In other versions that might also be structured the same, but in some cases they do diverge as well. And they portray the fairy godmother as a hunchbacked woman in rags with a grotesque face and filthy rags, but Cinderella seems to welcome her in this version. And I also particularly love the detail that Balanchine goes into in describing the Prokofiev music. He says, quote, the harp is plucked gently, and again the eerie high piercing cry that heralded the arrival of the old beggar woman causes Cinderella to look up and smile. The music is magical like the loveliness of a dream. It grows in volume as the lower strings sound a full promising melody. The room in which Cinderella sits seems to disappear, its walls vanishing. The old woman stands in the center of the room. 
She looks at Cinderella and then something more extraordinary happens. In a flash, the old hag is transformed into a lovely, kind fairy. The ragged Cretan becomes a beautiful creature dressed in a shimmering gown. Let's try to ignore any sexist or offensive language that's happening in there and focus on the magic for the time being. The description of the fairy of spring, summer, autumn, and winter is also lovely. And in this version, the fairy godmother does tell Cinderella to bring a pumpkin. And before the girl's astonished eyes, she changes the pumpkin into a magnificent coach. This image has lasted really well to the present day and, of course, also appears in the Disney telling of the tale, which I'm also not focusing on here, although I do sometimes use some of the Disney music ideas, which the children are familiar with when I'm teaching younger students. And we can sort of compare and contrast and share between different versions and the telling of our story in those contexts. So another classic theme is how Cinderella must leave the ball before the clock strikes 12. There's some great music that goes with that that I'll go into a little bit later. And the magic will vanish as mysteriously as it came, and she will be just a lonely girl again, dressed in shabby clothes. At the ball, the stepsisters make an absurd entry, and there's some laughs around that. Friends of the prince bring his, um, herald him into the party, and the guests greet him. Then Cinderella's ragged fairy godmother interrupts the court. And then there's also a sort of magical scene of stars and fairies welcoming Cinderella in. Balanchine describes Cinderella's dance and her movements to convey a youthful and tender joy. She feels at the ball, it is as if she had belonged there, for she is unembarrassed and confident in her natural graciousness. Cinderella and the prince lead the court in an ensemble dance. The music is a bright, sparkling waltz that gradually gains in sonorous force and all the guests are caught up in the spirit of romance. Suddenly, as the waltz gains relentless force, cymbals shimmer and we hear the loud ticking of a clock. A flourish of trumpets announces the approach of midnight. Her beautiful dress becomes her ragged work clothes, and she flees into the night, leaving behind one of her slippers. She wakes and thinks she may have dreamed of the ball. Only the slipper she finds hidden her in her apron convinced her that she really was there, that there was a handsome prince, and that he did love her. She dances again with the broom. Enamored of a girl he cannot find, the prince is determined to discover the owner of the shoe left behind. He vows that he will marry her. Of course, the stepsisters try on the shoe, and that fails. And in different versions of the story, that is non-functional in different ways. But in every case, this slipper will only fit Cinderella. And in this way, she is revealed. And finally, in Act 3, the music sounds soaringly the theme of ideal romance that marked the couple's first recognition of love. Now there's one more version that Balanchine particularly highlights, and that's the one choreographed by Ben Stevenson and first presented by the National Ballet at the Lister Auditorium in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. on April 24th, 1970. Here he really gets into more uh, description of the similarities and differences between this version and the Ashton works. We can actually learn more about the Ashton work through this. For example, by re in reviewing the production of Cinderella in his British magazine, Ballet Today, K. Rinfretti, or Rinfret wrote, quote, Ashton Cinderella for the Royal Ballet influenced Stevenson's ballet in several aspects. Like Ashton, Stevenson employs the English pantomime tradition by having the stepsisters played in travesti, and he excludes the stepmother who usually appears in Russian productions. Also, Stevenson omits the prince's search around the world. Unlike Ashton, Stevenson changes the sequence of musical numbers in the ballroom scene to give the grand pas de deux a traditional formal structure. The adagio is followed by the man's then the ballerina's variations. The adagio in the last act is less involved with fantasy, closer to a real life love relationship. This meaning is understood by the choreography 
which includes thematic elements, but in different combinations. There are fewer lifts, more terre-a-terre work, including swift runs with sudden directional changes, as if the lovers were blown by the wind. Structurally, this adagio is the climax of the ballet, combining and reconciling the literary themes of fantasy versus reality, and the choreographic motifs of floating lightness versus heaviness or a sense of weight. In the final coronation scene, heavy looking imperial crowns are placed on the heads of Cinderella and the prince. The fantasy, lightness, becomes the reality, weight. The stepsisters do not monopolize the show. Their hilarious antics are most clever in sequences with the dancing master and at the ball when they send up ballet steps, such as one sister holding an attitude for several seconds and then collapsing in a heap. The father, depicted as a multiple henpecked man unable to cope, is a kind of transition figure between the good Cinderella and the evil stepsisters. Of Stevens's version, this reviewer says, quote, he cannot prevent the first scene of Cinderella and her sisters from appearing prosy. It always does in any production, but he does give his two lovers the most intricately stylish pas de deux. I find this really interesting because often the first acts of ballet, specifically the Nutcracker, uh, do come across very, pro across very prosy. They're telling the, of the story and the relationship often in a really literal way that then is unfolded more metaphorically and more symbolically in choreography in the later acts or later scenes when that groundwork is, has already been introduced. So they advance the story, but I get it, prosy. So that's the skinny from George Balanchine and Francis Mason on the ballet. Now, when it comes to resources for teaching younger kids classes, then I'm going to turn to some children's books for that, which in the video version of this podcast, you'll get to see. And of course, you will only hear in the podcast version of this podcast. So one of my favorite resources when teaching some of the stories of the ballet, always popular, is a little bit of coloring. And I have this Dover coloring book of favorite ballets that includes a couple of really magical scenes from Cinderella that kids love. One is this ballet elegantly portrays the classic Perrault fairy tale of the gentle girl and her cruel stepsisters. Cinderella must stay behind when her stepsisters attend the king's ball. However, Cinderella's fairy godmother provides the girl with a coach to ride in as well as a ball gown. And here she is providing said coach. And there's also a picture of the ball itself of which is it, it is said at the ball Cinderella meets the prince who dances with her eagerly charmed by her grace and beauty but Cinderella must leave before her fairy godmother's spell is broken in her haste she leaves behind one of her slippers a great classical ballet image of what that ball scene may look like and the prince declares that he will marry the girl whose foot fits into the slipper. Many come to try it on, including Cinderella's stepsisters. Of course, her stepsister's large feet won't fit the slipper. When Cinderella tries it on, it does fit, and the prince is delighted to ask for her hand in marriage. So there's also this um, comical depiction of one of the stepsisters of Cinderella. And all colored in. That looks a little something like this. <laughs> yeah, so I'm pretty excited we're going to be sharing the story with the younger students and some of the variations of my older ballet students here in the month of, well, late September and early October usually. Another one of my favorite resources when it comes to young children's dance pre-ballet and primary ballet levels is a child's introduction to classical ballet, the story's music and magic of classical dance by Laura Lee. And she has a, a full retelling that's a couple pages on the Cinderella story. Uh, but I'll just read the beginning. I bet you already know the story of Cinderella. It has been a favorite fairy tale for hundreds of years, and for more than 200 years, choreographers have been making ballets based on it. 
This is the most famous one, and by that, Li means the Rodislav Zakharov version that was performed first in Moscow in 1945, but they do acknowledge there were plenty of earlier versions before that. This one just became very popular and successful. Everyone knows the story of Cinderella. There may be as many as 1,500 versions of the story from all over the world. Here is how they say Cinderella in some other countries. So in France, it's saint -Lion. In Germany, they say it's Aschenbrödel, uh, Brödel, but I've heard also Aschenputtel. And in Russia, Zolushka. Lee also shares a bit about a specific production or a specific approach to portraying the stepsisters, quote, ugly indeed. In England and America, the ugly stepsisters are often danced by men in women's dresses, so they will look comical and physically ugly. In Russia, they are played by real ballerinas, and only their behavior is ugly, not their faces. She provides a photo, and actually I have another um, copy of this photo in another book, but quickly we will also share some of the imagery from the illustrations by Meredith Hamilton. There is an opening image with Cinderella at the hearth in the ashes, sad that she's not going to the ball, and then we also have a depiction of Cinderella's carriage, her pumpkin carriage that the fairy godmother grants her to get to the ball and the ball itself. In the Ballet Companion, A Dancer's Guide to the Technique, Traditions, and Joys of Ballet by Eliza Gaynor Minden, there are several mentions of Cinderella, but I thought we might particularly enjoy the recounting of how Frederick Ashton, quote, produced ballets that celebrated English style and sensibility, including symphonic variations and scènes de ballet, Cinderella, 1948. Ashton's first full-length original work was made on Moira Shearer of the Red Shoes fame. Fontaine, that is Marco Fontaine, was sidelined by an injury, and Ashton himself was perhaps the most hilarious ugly stepsister ever. And here is a picture of Frederick Ashton on the right and Robert Helpman as Cinderella's ugly stepsisters in 1972. That again is following a tradition of dance and travesty, which actually is seen in several other of the great classical ballets as well. Gaynor Menden further shares that, quote, 1893, Pirina Lignani, wearing special reinforced Italian-made shoes and able to spot her turns, performs 32 fouettes on full point in Cinderella. Audiences are thrilled. So even very early on, Cinderella was a showcase for dancing virtuosity. In How to Ballet, a step-by-step -step guide to the secrets of ballet, by Jane Hackett, we see further depictions of Cinderella. Quote, when Cinderella's nasty stepmother and stepsisters go to the prince's ball, she is left alone in the cold house. A fairy godmother gives Cinderella a beautiful dress and a carriage so she can go to the ball too, but warns her that she must be home by midnight when the magic spell will be broken. Cinderella dances with the prince, but as the clock strikes 12, she runs away, leaving her shoe behind. The prince searches for the beautiful girl who fits the shoe. He finds Cinderella. They are married. And the pictures are of a royal ballet production of Cinderella with Alina, Kojukaru on the left in the title role, and Johann Koburg above as the prince. So we see Cinderella in her rags, dancing and dreaming, and then the prince. Although thousands of versions of Cinderella exist, it seems that the two main versions popular today, at least in the West, are the Brothers Grimm version and the Perrault fairy tale. Now Perrault 
is influences more heavily the classical ballet version or retelling of the story, I believe, as well as the animated Disney version. But the Grimm version is still very popular in many parts of the world as well, as shared in Mein Buch der Schönsten Mädchen, illustrated by Verena Korting, which is um, in German, the telling of these classic fairy tales. I love the illustrations in this book, as well as the opportunity to learn the German for some of these fairy tales. So here's a bewildered prince with the left behind shoe in the dark garden as Cinderella runs away through the night. I found a handy comparison chart of the Perot and the Grimm versions online, which I will link in the blog version or the article version of all of this content. But a quick summary of some of the key points that I found particularly interesting are whether Cinderella's mother is alive at the beginning of the telling of the tale. In the Perot version, she has already passed, and Cinderella in the first scene is living with her father, stepmother, and stepsisters. And in the Grimm version, she's actually still alive at the beginning of the story and passes on wisdom to Cinderella that then Cinderella holds on to after her death and uh, follows. In both versions, Cinderella is sweet and kind. A key difference is the person or the character who helps Cinderella prepare for the ball and enables her to go to that event. In the case of the Perot version is her fairy godmother. And of course, in the ballet version, the fairy godmother is quite literally a fairy. Um, although she appears at first as an elderly lady. And in the Grimm version, her helpers are the birds themselves who are sent by God to reward her piety. In the Perot version, the slippers are glass. In the Grimm version, they are made of gold. And ultimately, the stepsisters have different fates into these two retellings of the tale. In Perot, she, Cinderella forgives them and marries them off to wealthy noblemen, so they end up all doing well. <clears throat> In the Grimm version, um, it's rather macabre, their eyes are pecked out by pigeons and they become blind for the rest of their lives. Of course, they also cut off portions of their feet in an effort to try to fit inside of Cinderella's shoe, and that does not happen. In the pro version, they simply don't fit. The moral of the story, while similar, also takes on different flavors. In Perot, it is that success comes to girls who are graceful and have the blessing of their godparents. In Grimm, it is that the falsehood and wickedness will be punished severely. So yeah, I prefer it. Obviously, the ballet version takes the more positive spin of everyone living happily ever after. Um, and yeah, in some cases of the, the story, only those who did good end up living ha happily ever after, and those who did evil do not. When first learning to teach Cinderella to especially young students and those who are being introduced to the ballet story for the first time, I received help from Betty Rowan, who is the author of the book Dance and Grow. And she has uh, so much inspiration in that book and in other articles and books that she has published um, and of particular use to me in planning my curricula at first was her theme ideas. So there's themes for different times of the year and different sorts of settings that are really great and have musical accompaniment as well. So as a dance educator, this might be a particular interest to you. Or if you just want to work and play with children on telling the story through movement, here's some ways to get started with that. So in Cinderella, says Rowan, the Prokofia ballet music has some fine selections for dance accompaniment. The following scenes are good for improvisation. Step one, 
Quote, the ugly stepsisters argue and give orders to Cinderella. The suggested music is percussive and encourages children to do sharp, angular movements. The class might be divided into trios, two sisters and Cinderella, as they exchange the pantomime of bickering into dance. For the music, as Rowan suggests, the classical ballet music accompanies this really well. And I also have a more contemporary or the, the motion picture version of a music that might be good for an opening improvisation instead with Cinderella dreaming of going to the ball and dancing with her broom and cleaning. So this Classical ballet music comes from the Prokofiev Cinderella, Opus 87, Act 1, played by the London Symphony Orchestra. And it has that percussive sound where they're going back and forth. And I include all of these tracks on a playlist that is Cinderella for pre-ballet and creative dance. So it starts out a little bit dreamy. And then we have the percussive sounds of perhaps arguing. Longing down. Back and forth. So we have the Cinderella and her sisters interacting. From the Cinderella original motion picture, another classic is a dream. It's a wish your heart makes. So if you're focusing more on that dreaming, wishing upon a star, um, a life of the mind and fantasy, that is a classic track for all of that improvisation or choreography. There's so many versions of this song, so you can pick your favorite. But I think it's lovely. Whatever you wish. Yeah. So then in step two, quote, when Cinderella is alone, the fairy godmother appears. A duet between Cinderella and the fairy godmother can be developed. Pairs of children can improvise to an appropriate section of the ballet music, which is lyrical. At the end of the duet, Cinderella is transformed from her ugly appearance to beauty. The pair dance together. So this music too can be accompanied by the music from the classical ballet, which is the first appearance of this beautiful driving waltz theme. Or you can use the more contemporary music from the Disney Cinderella of Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo as the musical accompaniment for this casting of the spell granting Cinderella's wish and her departure for the ball. In step three, Quote, everyone rejoices at the wedding. A more formal dance in promenade formation might be introduced here for older groups. Although many parts of the story need to be narrated, the selected sections offer opportunities to develop dances through improvisation and or simple choreography. Some suggested music for these further scenes. I like to include a section where Cinderella is actually dancing with the prince at the ball. And that could either use the classical ballet music from Act One. Such an uh, iconic piece, very recognizable. or something more general, but still grand. This is Richard Maddox, 50, Al Shema, 
from Music for Movement and Imaginations, which I loved using it in a lot of different storytelling scenarios. And you can also wrap up the story with a banquet or a wedding or a celebration at the end. Another fun scene to include with perhaps older children or maybe with the younger ones as well is the clock striking midnight. So that could be the Prokofiev version from Act 2. You can hear the clock. Or the Disney version. It's both very dramatic, so consider that when you're working with especially small children. Uh, but that can be a fun, dramatic scene also to portray. I'll include a link to that playlist of tracks for use with improvisation and choreography in the full version of the blog or article. With older students, it's fun to focus on key pieces of repertory to watch in different versions as well as learn to perform. So we could include the variations of the spring fairy, the summer fairy, grasshoppers and dragonflies, the autumn fairy and winter fairy, either in the full choreographic version or in simplified versions, as well as the clock scene or the grand waltz. Now there's lots of, as I mentioned, there's lots of different versions of this ballet and lots of fun contemporary, more modern versions to explore, as well as very classical versions that follow original choreography. One in particular that I'd like to mention is Saint-Léon at the Paris Opera, Opera Ballet. Now, Saint-Léon is just the French name of Cinderella, but there is a particular version by Rudolf Nureyev that depicts, instead of a more traditional scene, more of a golden age of Hollywood, 1920s flappers and filmmaking version of the Cinderella tale, where she's trying to get into show business. And I enjoyed that, unfortunately, on Auto, the local channel here. So it's harder to find a full-length version online on YouTube, but take a look and see what you can find. I definitely recommend it. And I talk a little bit more about that as part of my Adult Adaptive Summer Dance Intensive, or Adaptive Adult Summer Dance Intensive, which I hosted for the first time last summer, but can be completed at any time of year. I'll include a link to more information about that again in the blog. Thanks for joining me to talk about the ballet Cinderella. I hope you enjoyed it. And if so, let me know what you appreciated down below in the comments. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Happy fall.